Today we have uh, Professor Tom Leininger here at the law school. His research relates to um, revisions to ethical and evidentiary codes to promote access to justice and ensure fair treatment of indigent parties in court. So with that, um, let's hear from Tom about his ongoing research project. And thank you all for joining us today. What I'm trying to do in my research is think of ways in which we might improve evidentiary privilege rules and to a lesser extent, ethics rules. Uh, the main focus of this particular facet of the project is evidentiary rules with a goal toward making those rules more inclusive and helping all categories of litigants, but in particular, helping to ameliorate some of the disparities that are detrimental to low income and minority litigants. And what I'll do in this presentation is lay out um, a range of ideas that are under consideration. I want to make clear at the outset that not all of these ideas will make the cut <laughs> for the final proposal. And one area in which I could benefit from your insights is, you know, which ones have more legs than others. Typically in my research and writing, I cast a wide net and refine uh, as I go along. So that's one goal I have for today's discussion is to see if some of these ideas uh, might need to undergo some more um, review and revision. So the basic idea is that evidentiary privileges are rules at the state level, they're codified in statute, at the federal level, they're in common law. And these rules allow parties in litigation to exclude from evidentiary use certain sensitive material that tends to consist mostly of communication in confidential settings um, in which a party or a witness has interacted with a person, usually a professional, whose status confers some confidentiality that the law protects. So historically, what these privileges have done, and I'm sharing this level of kind of basic information because I know we have some non-lawyers who may be watching. Uh, the idea is that what a privilege will do is, is prevent a question. It will prevent the extraction of information by lawyers in discovery or in uh, litigation in court. And it tends to relate to certain time-honored relationships like the doctor-patient relationship, the lawyer-client relationship, and there are other similar ones for spousal, clergy, um, psych psychiatrist-patient relationship, et cetera. The problem I want to focus on in particular is that many segments of society, and in particular minorities and low-income people, are increasingly unlikely to have the relationships that are sufficient to trigger the application of traditional privileges, and that's why I'd like to modernize them. The results of this widening gap in who can claim the privileges are that low-income and BIPOC people may have constrained privacy rights and a greater vulnerability to mistreatment because they can't benefit to the same extent as um, litigants with better resources from these privileges. Uh, so what I'm trying to do is make some proposals to help to level the playing field. So now I'll go through this in a little more detail. How do privileges work? Oh, I've somehow covered up that. Oh, there we go. So a privilege holder may invoke the privilege. It doesn't operate automatically, but a privilege holder may assert the privilege to bar the use of certain information in evidence. It doesn't foreclose any use of the information. And that's part of the reason why we have this parallel world of ethical limitations on attorneys and judges. But really what a privilege does is bar the use in court or let's say in discovery, depositions, requests for admissions, things like that. And it basically limits what lawyers can obtain. There are two broad categories of rationales for privileges. One is utilitarian. For example, we wanna encourage candid and forthright communication uh, with lawyers, because that not only benefits individ individual clients, but it makes the court system run more smoothly if people can count on their lawyers and repose confidence in their lawyers. 
And the same argument could be made for, you know, the doctor patient relationship, for example. And then sometimes we simply want to encourage the relationship, like the spousal relationship is encouraged by creating this safe haven for communication. But there's also the humanistic side, which is respecting autonomy and privacy for its own sake. Uh, historically, privileges have been mostly about communication with particular categories of people. Now, there are reasons why it makes sense to uh, apply privilege most commonly for certain sorts of relationships. It's easier to discern where the lines are. It's also e more easily administrable in court proceedings to know if you are talking to the right audience rather than to police, let's say, the subject matter of the conversation. And then make no mistake, those groups that have legislative protection for their communication with their clients um, are careful to continue to lobby and preserve that communication. The problem increasingly is that these professions that merit protection in privilege law are sort of pricing out entire categories of people in society. And so these expensive professional credentials may very well be the sine qua non of an evidentiary privilege. And so the term privilege actually has double meaning here. It's sort of limited in its accessibility to um, better healed litigants. All right, so why are privileges valuable? They're going to be helpful in many categories of legal proceedings and including but not limited to consumer protection. Because this is a consumer protection grant, I just wanna pause and take account of the ways in which consumer protection does necessitate careful enforcement of privilege law. So before you even get to court, people must be able to discern that they've been mistreated in a way that's potentially actionable. That assessment for all but the most sophisticated consumers does require conferring with others who can share advice, talk about their own experiences. Then before you even bring any legal action, one must assess the opportunities for legal recourse, see how well the facts match whatever remedies are conceivably available. And then you take the next step to vindicate your right in some administrative or legal proceeding. You can imagine that of course the attorney client privilege, but also some of the other privileges for interaction with other advisors are really crucial at these various stages uh, in which consumers ponder whether and how to pursue remedies. Uh, if consumers don't have the same access to privilege law as their opponents, you can imagine, it doesn't take an expert on evidence law to realize that all the opponent, the defendant would need to do is somehow obtain a bunch of admissions by that consumer in these third party conversations They'd all be admissible uh, because admissions by a party opponent are some of the most readily admissible examples of evidence, and it'd be really hard to win. It's also uh, relevant to Bryce's presentation on privacy to note that while privilege uh, law applies in litigation, its implications are felt much more broadly. For example, as a former prosecutor, I'm aware that it was very difficult to conduct um, surveillance uh, of a privileged uh, communication. And so what we do with privilege law is we create some uh, safe havens and a, an area of calm repose in which people can operate and psychologically um, feel a sense of privacy that is uh, valuable intrinsically. All right, so I would argue there's an elitist trend in privilege law, I mean, it's not, explicit in the statutes, it's just the reality of the demographic trends in our society. It's well established that 80% of the legal needs of low-income people go unmet in, in the sense that low-income people don't obtain access to counsel for about 80% of their legal needs. They either don't pursue um, any sort of legal action or do it on a pro se basis, meaning without attorneys. So, or perhaps get uh, legal advice or advice relevant to the law from sources that wouldn't qualify under the attorney-client privilege, you know, for protection. Think about medical care. It's, it's all over the news how difficult um, it is for low-income people to obtain medical care. Increasingly, the involvement of doctors and other sort of high-end professionals explicitly mentioned in the doctor-patient privilege has become um, 
you know, more difficult for low income people and concomitantly the scope of the privilege is, is less valuable to those people. Uh, it, it's very well settled that marriage rates are declining uh, in lower income uh, strata. And so if the uh, communications privilege for one's spouse or partner is limited to marriage or um, you know, marriage-like domestic partnership, that will limit the utility of that privilege to low-income people. Uh, and there's recent research, let's see, did I miss a bullet point? Yeah, there's recent research that uh, low-income people are less likely to attend traditional houses of worship, which are the ones that are more commonly um, mentioned and covered by the clergy penitent privilege. So I'll note here, there's some overall strategies to make privilege law more inclusive and equitable. And I pursue these in my project. First, you could expand the list of qualifying relationships to include people other than the most highly credentialed, uh, most expensive professionals. Uh, it's also important to consider that privilege need not always be grounded in the identity audience with whom a party speaks. It could also have to do with the subject matter discussed. This is um, evident in what's not quite a privilege, the work product doctrine allows protection of an attorney's mental impressions concerning the subject matter under litigation. That's one of the rare instances of a subject-based <clears throat> protection of information. And perhaps if we considered other opportunities to make subjects off limits rather than uh, conditioning that protection on the identity of the audience, we could uh, extend these protections more fairly to low-income people. To the extent that we backstop privilege with ethical duties for lawyers and judges uh, that apply irrespective of um, you know, which parties are the third parties at issue, that could strengthen protection for low-income people and others. Uh, another challenge, and I wonder if Judge Sugar has observed this, um, since Oregon decriminalized some drug cases, is that fewer cases involving law enforcement interaction with citizens now come to court, right? Because there aren't uh, criminal proceedings that, that follow. And so because a lot of our privacy protections were based on constitutional rules that were enforced by the exclusion of evidence, there may be some value in codifying what heretofore were constitutional principles and making those basically statutory rules that apply irrespective of whether the government files a case against a person, say, found with drugs. And then another uh, challenge is that uh, low-income people don't always assert privileges in part because they lack the assistance of counsel. And so one additional area for reform might be creating opportunities for low-income people to get access to counsel just to assert privileges or perhaps uh, creating uh, more space for judges to step in as many judges do now with respect to the Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. So I'll offer a few examples of uh, reforms I'm considering, and then I'll be interested in your feedback. So uh, I wanna make sure that my, my gallery of people is not cutting into my PowerPoint here. All right, so the first example would be to broaden the attorney-client privilege to touch a wider range of third parties uh, that a client or a party might interact with for advice on legal matters. So right now, of course, it extends to attorneys, but as I mentioned earlier, a lot of people can't afford attorneys. There are here in Lane County, Oregon, for example, some really important um, volunteers and non-lawyers who are assisting litigants. Uh, one example I recently became aware of is um, a group of volunteers who help asylum seekers gather information relevant to their petitions for political asylum. Also, Oregon, along with other states, uh, you know, continues to explore opportunities to widen who can do um, what heretofore were exclusively legal services. We need our privilege law to be more expansive and touch a, a range of people in whom clients repose confidence about legal matters. Uh, 
Then another uh, way to approach this problem would be to take the approach that is the core of the work product doctrine that protects attorneys' mental impressions, typically recorded on yellow legal paper, and extends that same protection to pro se litigants. Uh, why aren't we protecting their uh, confidential mental impressions just as if they were lawyers? Now, I think a perhaps more difficult uh, possibility uh, to consider would be the idea of conditioning the privilege on the nature of the topic and not necessarily on the audience with whom one communicates. If you think about it, making the involvement of a lawyer sort of the key inquiry about what should be protected could lead to both an under-inclusive and over-inclusive approach to protecting secrets under-inclusive in that we, we fail to capture all the times non-lawyers are important in helping people with legal tasks, over-inclusive in that it may capture some communication with lawyers that uh, may not be deserving of protection. Uh, and then, of course, another important step here would be to liberalize what uh, non-lawyers can do. I want to cover quickly a few other areas and then invite your feedback. So how about a similar broadening of the uh, physician-patient privilege to touch a wider range of advisors who are helpful on health-related matters. So just consider all the examples here. Uh, because of the pandemic, because of all the problems related to global warming, because of the increasing difficulty of obtaining abortions and the need for counseling, uh, some of which is not simply about the medical issues involved with abortions, uh, and the prevalence of non-traditional healthcare providers. There are a lot of people who aren't traditional doctors or who aren't enumerated among the helpers of doctors uh, who would qualify for protection under our currently more narrowly tailored version of the physician-patient privilege. And I think it'd be wise to expand that. And part of our research team's goal is to um, quantify to the extent, the extent to which these other categories of people are involved in assisting low-income and minority uh, patients. Uh, the waiver provisions are currently too expansive. In other words, when one files a suit that puts at issue one aspect of one's medical history, a lot of the privacy protections fall away and there may be a need to um, look more carefully at those waiver provisions. And here, once again, it might be time to consider a subject-based protection. In other words, one who discusses a medical matter with a trusted third party in confidence might be a person who needs protection, even if you don't engage the services of some high-priced doctor. There would also be room for improvement of other uh, health-related privacy rules in a, a variety of settings, including schools, shelters, uh, correctional facilities. Let's consider another example of an area in which expanding privilege law would help low-income and BIPOC people. Right now, the spousal, testimonial, and marital communications privileges are focused on spouses, whether through traditional marriage or in some states, domestic partners. But the rates of such coupling um, are lower among low-income uh, people. And it's really well quantified that with each uh, passing year, those rates continue to decline. So we might want to consider expanding what, um, what will count as a partner beyond the current limits on who can be a spouse, who can be a domestic partner. Some research shows that, um, in fact, my wife's done some of this research, shows that non-resident co-parents uh, do a lot of important uh, conversations, have a lot of important conversations with um, parties that deserve protection. And we need to expand this uh, privilege to reach such people. Intergenerational privileges <clears throat> could be valuable, including a parent-child privilege. And the state of Hawaii is experimenting with a trusted person privilege that uh, could extend, for example, to another person in the household who may not necessarily be covered by the above listed privileges. Now, these are in the context of consumer litigations. Th these are the first people you turn to to sort of suss out whether you've experienced some sort of actionable 
mistreatment. Another challenge is to integrate these family privileges with the attorney-client privilege. I won't get into the wonky details, but right now there's a misalignment when a subset of the family has an attorney, the involvement of others might defeat the privilege depending on the circumstances. Uh, let me just note some other possible reforms. We need to broaden the clergy penitent privilege. They just did research in the year 2021 and discovered for the first time in US history that the percentage of our society that goes to traditional houses of worship has dipped below 50%. But the percentage of people who still consider that they have spiritual advisors and uh, other people with whom they have sort of a religious relationship is higher than 50%. And the um, decline in attendance at traditional houses of worship is greatest among low-income minority uh, and immigrant people. Uh, consumer counselors who aren't lawyers might be people who should be noted uh, as uh, potentially triggering a pr privilege in our state privilege statutes. Union organizers need to confer with prospective members of unions. And one possibility is to create a privileged relationship that certainly would bring benefit to low-income people. Mental health counselors, including counselors for people who've experienced domestic violence. Um, some states, including Oregon, have a DV counselor privilege that could be more expansive. Now, if a person involved in such a communication is a psychologist, we're not gonna have any trouble classifying the conversation as privileged. But um, a lot of counselors who do valuable work and especially for low-income people aren't covered by current privileges. There's some talk and I think it deserves, uh, AA and NA meetings are times in which people let their guards down, and certainly those are circumstances in which people benefit from confidentiality. As I mentioned, police investigations are not uh, under scrutiny by judges to the same extent uh, if the investigations are for decriminalized conduct. So you might want to codify protections in that department. And finally, um, the ethical rules that require forbearance by attorneys and judges from extracting privileged information from third parties need to be strengthened. The rest of the slideshow would have just explained the progress our group has made, the information our um, research team has compiled so far, the conferences I've been to, and the remaining tasks.